Welcome Ella, Tat, and Carla. Thank you very much for being with us today. And let me turn the conversation now over to Carla. Karina, thank you so much. And Ella and Tat, thank you so much for doing this. And thank you everybody who's here today. Um, we're gonna chat among us just for about 20, 25 minutes and then questions. You're all journalists. I'm sure you're going to have a lot of questions. So Ella, can we start with you um, by talking about the threat environment as we national security people refer to it? Uh, the IWMF announcement on your safety training, uh, training, and I want to talk about that, referred to, quote, a spike in physical and digital violence directed against U.S. newsrooms in particular. And it said this year alone, 30 journalists have been assaulted and eight have been arrested in the U.S., um, all following a surge of anti-media rhetoric. And you also said that the U.S. currently ranks 45th on the World Press Freedom Index, down from 32 just a decade ago. And also that this abuse disproportionately affects women and diverse journalists who are often reluctant to speak out for fear of jeopardizing their careers. Can you talk a little bit about the threat environment um, here in the U.S., what's driving it and the different forms it's taking? It's taking? Yeah, sure. Um, so... I'm Alice Stapley, I'm a digital security um, advisor. Um, so when I look at the threat environment, I'm looking at it from a digital safety standpoint. Um, what we do see in the US, um, and we have seen now for a number of years, is a, a massive uptick in online abuse or online violence, as it's now called, um, in order to get across the seriousness of the situation. So when we're talking about online abuse, online violence, what we're really saying there is, attacks on journalists that are now so serious that it's really limiting their ability to do their work. And it's really having, I don't say this lightly, an impact on, on democratic conversation. Um, so one of the biggest issues that you see um, in the US is this, along with common tactics that are used with online harassment and online violence. And that includes uh, the publishing of journalists' personal information online, uh, known as doxing. This includes their home address or personal contact, um, such as a personal email or personal phone number, for example, with an intent to do them some kind of harm. And we do see that being used against journalists uh, in the US, especially if they're covering particular beats. Um, and that, that includes um, so far, kind of far right or outright groups, for example, um, who who one of their tactics is doxing journalists online or people who 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 disagree, who talk about them um, in a way that they don't agree with. Um, so that is one of the biggest sets we're seeing, and we're in an election year. I do think um, we did see this during uh, the last election. There will be an increase um, in online abuse and harassment during that time. Um, and um, and all the other threats that come with it, which include doxing, but also things such as uh, phishing attacks, for example, um, malware attacks um, and possible hacking attacks of accounts, for example, could also be um, something that we see an uptick in. Um, other threats that journalists are facing uh, if they're going out um, and they're covering the election. So uh, some of these uh, rallies or places where they're going, uh, the chance of a physical confrontation might be quite high. So you're seeing that kind of damaged equipment, which it sounds like a physical safety issue, but it's actually uh, a digital security issue as well. So journalists quite often carrying their personal devices instead of work devices. Um, that's very common, especially for freelancers. Um, and, um, you know, if you haven't backed those devices up, the content on them, or if you're detained and those devices are searched, for example, uh, what about the content that you have on them? Um, how safe is that content? Not, not very. Um, and do you have sensitive contacts um, on there or content that could put you or your sources at risk is something also that, that journalists, um, you know, need, need to be thinking about, I would say. Um, um, and we do see that um, uh, across the US, obviously some, some areas, some states may be more complicated than others. So I, I want to get to Tat and, and talk about your experiences and that of your colleagues and then want to talk to both of you, because it seems like there's this intrinsic tension here, because I mean, I'm going to really date myself. Back in the day, um, when I started in the business, the idea that we would want to not share our emails or not share our phone numbers with people who we would want to be reaching out with us. Um, you wouldn't want to hide from potential people who could be potential sources. So I understand there has to be a, a you know, separation between the public and the private because the private can really 
be a vulnerability, but it does, it's certainly a very different world from the world in which uh, when I started, and I will add, I started writing with a typewriter back in, in Tad, there used to be typewriters <laughs> for, for you youngins. Okay, so Tad, can you talk, talk about your your experience and that of your colleagues and not, and, and in Seattle, but also the people that you 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 deal with in, in in the groups that you work with? Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about like my like personal experience. So last year I was covering like a, the local response to um, like the national like uptick in anti drag legislation, and I interviewed like several like um, like trans drag performers about um, you know how that had an impact on them. Um, like it, it's severely like um, like limited their um, you know. In terms of like violence, they were experiencing violence, um, and it was like difficult for them to to navigate uh, this like increasing uh, increasingly like hostile climate um, where like anti drag like legislation was just going through the the U.S. Um, so from me like writing that that story, I started to get like a lot of um, like transphobic emails targeting me. And, and my sources. Um, and then from, you know, the, you know, transphobic emails and, and messages. Um, later on, there ended up being like a, this conservative Facebook page that also seen like the, the stories that I cover. And I've been covering like LGBTQ issues for a very long time, including writing, um, you know, personal essays about my, um, my experiences as like a trans person. And they like they wrote this whole um, this whole Facebook post about um, you know like calling me like a girl like uh, it was like this whole thing and and they included like you know that I work at the at the Seattle Times like it was like this very intense um, situation and it ended up escalating even more um, to the Blaze writing a story about me. Um, and uh, it, it just like, it just escalated for me. You know, I wrote the story, then, you know, there was the, the conservative Facebook page and then, you know, it, you know, it ended up in a story being, being written about me. And so like things like that are, are very, are very serious and really do have like a negative impact on how um, like trans journalists like do our work um, and, for me, like at that time, it did make me um, feel pretty like um, traumatized to see like how, um, you know, my story was like taken, like it was, it would just, it felt like it was just being used as this like, um, this negative force when I was trying to write about like why these drag performers were pushing for their craft and why they, they you know, they felt so intensely to push for their craft at a time of such hostility targeting drag performers. Um, so for me at that time, what was most important was to uh, like assess like my online pre my online presence and see how far um, was this going? Like how far was this harassment going? Um, so I made sure to um, like lock down my like accounts um, you know, that was very important for me to do. Um, also having a friend document um, the abusive language uh, that was coming up under the different posts was very helpful. Um, and just kind of like logging um, what was um, happening um, to me on like a day to day um, basis. Uh, yeah, so that's that's essentially what I experienced. And it made me want to, I guess in some way, it made me want to make sure that I'm I'm very careful about the information that I put out there about myself. Um, so I have since like removed like my email address, um, you know, uh, you know, from, you know, the Seattle Times like website. Um, I try to be pretty careful about what I put online about myself. Um, yeah, so that I, I would say those, that is how that had like, an impact on 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 me and my and my my role in, in journalism. So before you wrote that story, um, because of course you were writing about people being harassed because of what they did, did you think about the fact that you were going to be harassed for what you did in writing about them? 
at that time, I did not, um, I did not think about that, about how like writing about this story um, would have an, an impact on me. Um, at that time, I did not like think about that. Um, but now, like in hindsight, I know that it's important to um, be prepared for those like online um, attacks um, and like vitriol and, and, and everything. Um, but yeah, it's just like, um, I didn't realize like how far um, it would go. Um, Cause at that time I was also pretty vocal about, um, you know, the lack of diversity of trans journalists in um, just in, in journalism and in industry in general. Um, so that also caught fire online with folks, um, you know, targeting me for that as well. Um, so I feel like all of those situations start to make me like a very um, big target for, um, you know, for these for these folks. But I know now in the future that it's important for me to prepare for these online um, attacks and, and everything. So you talking about you preparing, um... I, Ellie, I want to go back to the training that IWMF does and this this handbook that that we're going to share with everybody that you they, you all have have developed, which has really I think absolutely fabulous worksheets. This is one which I have here, which is an online violence risk assessment, um, which talks about things like have you previously been targeted? You know, questions that you want to ask yourselves that newsrooms want to ask themselves before the work starts. Can you talk about the training that you all have done and some of the some of the things that 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 take place in that training that that makes you know, pre preemptively um, as, as well as as once things have happened. Some of them are big changes, uh, raising awareness in the newsroom, and some of them are actually technical changes, like some of the things Tat's talking about, training people about how to even reel back their information. When I read this, I thought to myself, God, there's so much information about there out me out there. Is it even possible to pull that back? Yeah, so unfortunately, Tat's story is pretty familiar to me. It's a story I've heard many times. Um, and um, what we used to see, so I'll talk a little bit about how online harassment kind of came to be and where it is now, just very briefly. So it used to be in the newsroom, online violence or harassment was seen as, you know, something that happened to normally women journalists and nobody really paid it that much attention if I'm honest with you um it's only in the last few years uh that that newsrooms have started more seriously to to pay attention to to online violence as an issue in terms of protecting their, their journalists um so online harassers were also seen as kind of just a guy in a hoodie in their basement attacking a person over and over and that that stereotype still exists, that person still exists, but now there's a whole other layer, there's a whole array of other actors involved, including um, state-sponsored actors, um, um, particular groups online who are hacking groups, but also other groups who feel very passionately about particular topics on the internet. And I use the word passionate there, not in, not in a positive sense, but also negative, so they have strong opinions about it. Um, and they will target journalists that publish on these issues. Um, and. And I think before we could predict who those journalists would be. So if you were covering particular beats, you were more likely to get harassment. But now we're seeing it as just a general attack against journalists, um, regardless of the beats. So if you're a sports journalist, you're likely to get attacked by sports fans. Um, equal, if you're covering, um, we know that journalists who, who are covering LGBTQ plus issues, anything to do with women, anything to do with race, disproportionately likely to um, face attacks and if they are from that community themselves even more so um and there's a lot of um uh, academic research that's been done on this so uh tat's situation I, unfortunately for me in my position i would see tat i would think this is a story that tat's covering the likelihood of tat getting abuse is incredibly high um now from our work with newsrooms what we we began to see um as that newsrooms started to think about how they could better protect um, their, their staff. In some newsrooms, um, you know, that conversation needed to be had, but some newsrooms were reaching out to us proactively. And I have to say the Seattle Times was one of those. Um, and I have to give a big shout out to the Seattle Times for their interest in the safety and security of their journalists. Um, and we worked very closely with the Seattle Times on this guide, actually. Um, so um, 
part of the preemptive support is not only raising awareness with upper management, because if upper management are not on board, it's very difficult to implement changes, um, but also uh, putting good practices in place. So the more you can do in advance of an online attack, the better it is for you, because it's very difficult to be putting best practice in place when you're in the middle of a firestorm. Um, so the more preemptive steps you can take, the better it is for you um, as a newsroom, but also as an individual journalist within that newsroom, especially if you fit into one of those categories that are more high risk. Um, so we at the IDM, at the IDMMF, uh, we've been working very closely with journalists. We started training journalists um, and newsrooms in data protection. So how to best protect your data online. This is the kind of information Tat was talking about, your email address, your cell phone, your home address. Um, but what we realized was the training wasn't enough because after the training, the journalists would go, well, now what? And the newsrooms would be like, well, we don't have anything. So what we needed was uh, policy. We needed best practices uh, that journalists could access easily and ideally roll out fairly easily to stuff. Now, I will say that a lot of content for this uh, does exist. There are other organizations that have been working on this topic also for an equally long number of time and they do amazing work. But what we were hearing from journalists was there's a lot of information and we need short, simple one pages that will really help us um, protect ourselves. And also editors were saying we need it to help protect our staff. So they didn't want to read a 50 page document. Um, what they wanted was a one page checklist, for example. So the guide that we created came out of a pilot that we ran with 10 newsrooms in the US and internationally, where we worked with, and the Seattle Times was one of those, uh, we worked with the newsroom very closely with a particular person in that newsroom to think what do they need and how could we implement that for them? Um, in some cases in the Seattle Times, they created their online, their own guide for online harassment. Um, in some cases, it was newsrooms that they only could really manage to have a checklist that would help them protect staff data as quickly as possible. So it really depends. Different newsrooms have different needs. There's no really one size fits all uh, when it comes to, to protecting um, uh, staff. I can't say to this newsroom, you need to do this. I can say, what is your capacity? Because a lot of newsrooms are overstretched, both financially, but also in terms of people. Um, and how many cooks are in the kitchen? Generally, the bigger the newsroom, the more difficult it is to roll out change quickly, because you need more buy-in from different areas within the newsroom. Uh, and a more su the most successful preemptive support, what we see is from newsrooms where there is a what we call a newsroom ch an, a, a champion in the newsroom someone who pushes for this someone who maintains that momentum and is also able to communicate with hr for example uh because some support needs to come from hr what do you do if you've got a journalist who needs time off for example because they've been getting death threats um support from it departments traditionally it departments in newsrooms are responsible for the website for making sure your email is running they're not generally resourced and, and and trained in how to deal with a journalist who's receiving thousands of death threats via their Twitter feed. Um, so getting newsrooms to think about that and also getting newsrooms to think about, you have journalists who are using their personal social media for work related content and you request them to do this, but you are not responsible for protecting those accounts. And that's a real gray area that leads a lot of journalists very vulnerable. So their work email may have all the digital security measures in place, and helped along by their IT team, but their personal Instagram account or their Facebook account has no security measures on it at all. And that is where they will be most vulnerable because online attackers, they don't just look at the journalist in the newsroom. They look at the journalist, the whole picture. So your data that you have on the internet is really your calling card to the world. So when people Google you, what they see is how you are to them. Um, so they make no distinction there. There's no distinction for them in terms of work and personal. Um, so at the IWMF, what we've been doing is really working with newsrooms to help them roll out these best practices as best as possible, um, to, to put them together, to help them write them, and then to, to sit with them and, and try and figure out how they can roll it out. Um, and some do it quicker than others, but um, there's been a lot of interest, especially now uh, during the election. <laughs> so Ted, can you, what's changed since your experience? What, what do you do differently now? Yeah, I would say maybe like one of the, the main things that I, that I do differently is like trying to um, prepare um, 
ahead of these potential like attacks. Um, so that includes like doxing myself and like, removing personal info about myself like online. So like signing up for like delete me, um, sending like takedown requests to, to data broker sites, um, submitting like info removal requests to Google. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, but um, trying to like take away that like personal information about myself. I would also say locking down my accounts and using like more two-factor, uh, you know, authentication. Um, to, uh, for like my passwords in the past, I have like just used very simple, easy to remember passwords, but I've learned like since the, the training that it's really important to have a password that's way more secure. Even if for me, I'm like, oh, I just want something that's easy to remember. So like using like a, pa uh, a, a password manager, like one password. Um, so that that has also been been helpful for me. Uh, and also be paying attention to my privacy settings, um, you know, on like Facebook or Twitter, um, you know, making sure that it's only me that can look up like my phone or my personal like email address. Um, so that that is helpful. And just generally like using the the resources from um, IWMF's like online violence response hub um, that has been very uh, helpful as well and making sure that I have a a good self-care um, practice and having like a team of folks that I can process um, these different challenges with because um, unfortunately like you know this won't probably be like you know the last time that I uh, experience like threats like this given the nature of my um, reporting. So it's really important for me to also have like a self-care practice in place. So um, maybe Ellie, you want to go through some of, of that a little bit more deep, deeply, although Tat sounds like Tat's really on top of it. Uh, <laughs> um, so these online data brokers, can you just, do you have to pay them to, to delete yourself or are they legally, res, res, you know, do they have to respond to a, a request like that? Okay. Um, so let me start by saying that the U.S. has some of the worst data privacy laws I've ever seen. In, we've, we've, <laughs> we've, we've, we've noticed that before. But, but. So it's very difficult for a journalist to protect their personal information just because so much information in the US has to exist in a public facing database, which for me is quite astounding really. If you buy a house, uh, I don't know if this is statewide or if it's in just in certain states. It but let me just say to, as journalists, we are ambivalent about this, okay? On a certain level, we want to protect ourselves, but on another level, that's really useful if a corrupt person is buying that house, okay? So we're, you know, we're not really crazy about the ability to erase yourself that exists in Europe. So we're ambivalent about this, but please go on. Yeah, um, but I think from a personal safety standpoint, it, it makes you very vulnerable. And the reason for this is that journalists are public facing. So, and, but you don't have any of the protection that is normally offered to kind of public facing people who maybe who work in government, for example, um, or if you're incredibly famous and have a lot of money, for example, you can hire people. So a lot of journalists don't have that. So um, it makes them very vulnerable. And they're also reporting on things people have strong opinions about or they don't want to hear. Um, and... Uh, they're also very, um, uh, they're very visible. So, and, and, and they give, um, this gives people something to focus on. And when they start digging, they, they start to find more and more information. So, um, and when I talk about journalists having information on the internet, I'm not saying that they shouldn't have anything because a journalist has to exist on the internet in some form um otherwise they they don't exist and they can't get work right so uh it's more about the type of information that they have on the internet so ideally if i were to look a journalist up online i would only find professional information about them their professional work email uh where they work uh, probably the town they live in um but i shouldn't be finding ideally pictures of their family i shouldn't be finding pictures of their dog in their park in their home uh, i shouldn't be finding photos of them on holiday last year ideally um so it's more about controlling the information and feeling that the journalist themselves is in control of that information that they have on the internet rather than people putting information on the internet about you um so data broker sites, uh, you're very familiar with them as journalists, you use them to look up sources, I'm sure, but people are also using them to look up you. Um, if I was a citizen, never mind just a journalist um, in the United States, I would be signing up 
to a service. Um, there are a number of them available. One of them is called Delete Me, uh, and they will remove you from these data aggregate sites. Um, now, you can remove yourself from these data aggregate sites, but they are basically scraping public data. So they just keep repopulating with the information. So it's basically a constant uh, uh, wheel basically of you requesting the information to be taken down and then taking it down but six months later putting it back up so uh, companies will do this for you and there's a whole industry now in the US around that um, now um, um, the information that they contain also is very personal so it includes your home address your phone number your email but also people you live with and family members etc and what we do see is people who harass online, if they can't find data on you, they may well go after family members. I've had journalists where this has happened to them before. They've gone after parents or siblings. Um, and it's, so it's also a bit about educating your family on what you're happy and not happy sharing online, um, especially if you live um, or have experienced already harassment. Um, so um, that's a little bit about data broker sites. We don't really see this in any, any other country. It's very unique to the United States um, with all the good and bad that they bring. But in terms of privacy for data, for, for journalist protection, uh, they're, they're not great. Um, other preemptive things that journalists can do is just Google yourself and other search engines, look yourself up regularly and just know what the internet says about you, whether that's negative, whether it's positive, just have a reading of what the internet is saying about you. I would sign up uh, to get Google alerts for your name and that will alert you if, if anything comes up on Google only about you. Um, and when you look yourself up online, just map if there's anything there that you're slightly uncomfortable with. Um, and that varies depending on the journalist. Um, it could be that some are more are happier with certain information being out there and some are less happy, uh, but that's really a personal decision that the journalist makes themselves. Um, and it really depends on what we call in the industry, their risk profile. So what do I mean by that? That's a little bit what I was talking about earlier when I was uh, talking about Tats case, the kind of beat you cover, whether you've experienced harassment previously um, or any other digital threats previously, uh, who those attackers may be. So it's very different, the far right or outright to a government, to um, you know, um, a group on the internet of Taylor Swift fans, for example. Um, so knowing who the threat is can be helpful because it helps you gauge how more or less the harassment will be and also other digital threats. Do they do hacking? Are they gonna commit identity theft in your name? Um, so getting a read on that is very important. Identity theft, a lot of groups like to, to attack in that way, take up credit cards in your name. So it's quite good to do a credit check on yourself and put a block on your credit if you are at high risk for that. Um, and you don't need to have this all the time. It could just be during periods of high levels of harassment, for example, during an election period where we see often a spike in online harassment. Um, once you have seen information about yourself online, you want to take it down. If you are the owner of that information, it's on your social media, et cetera, you take it down, the internet crawls through, it removes it. Please bear in mind that once you have something on the internet, it's very difficult to guarantee it's completely gone. Uh, the reason for that is people take screenshots uh, and there are also services such as the uh, internet archive um, services like the Wayback Machine, the, these type of services are very good at taking down data, actually, if you request, you have to go and request that they remove your personal data. So you may have deleted information from Google um, or from your own personal Facebook, but maybe a copy of it exists in the Wayback Machine. And quite often attackers will go there and search for that information and, and put it online. Um, so um, if somebody has put information about you on a, what we call a third party platform, they've written a horrible blog about you or it exists in a public database that's then it's very difficult to get that data taken down. It will depend on laws and legislation and that varies from state to state in the US um, and can be quite complicated. I've had journalists who've been quite successful in kind of copyright. So if people are using their image, um, they've, they've uh, instead of pursuing it through, well, there, there are very few laws in place to protect journalists from this, which is something else that, that's an issue. If you do receive online harassment, who do you go to um, legally? Um, or maybe even it's the authorities themselves that are harassing you in certain states. So um, maybe you don't want to go to the authorities, but there's very little legal protection really there for you um, to get that data taken down and protected. Um, so um, once you've done kind of knowing what the internet says about you, um, 
then you just need to make sure you have good account security. What do I mean by that? Uh, that means um, having um, something called two-factor authentication turned on. Most people are familiar with this these days. They weren't when I was doing this five years ago. Nobody had heard of it. And um, most people are using it now. Most people are familiar with this through internet banking, where you log into your account and a text message comes to your phone with a, or an email with a code. Um, most online services offer this now. Please, please turn on two-factor authentication. There are different types. Um, most people use SMS. Um, if you are covering anything to do with outright, far right, anything where, or hacking groups, or particular um, if you're covering foreign news, I don't know if there's any here, and you're covering countries that like to hack a lot, you want to be looking at something a bit more secure, such as an app uh, or a security key. Um, and then making sure, yeah, and Tap mentioned a password manager. The most important thing about passwords is that they're long. They should be uh, at least 15, one, five characters, um, and they should be different for each account. Sorry, everyone. Um, and the reason for that is if you are using the same password on this many accounts and one of those services that you have signed up for gets hacked, they've been keeping your password in an Excel sheet on their server instead of an encrypted form, then everyone will have your password through your Gmail account, your Instagram account, et cetera. That's why it's really important to have different passwords for different accounts. How you can do that using a password manager or is it is statistically safer to write them down and keep them safe in your home if you are feel safe in your home, if you're not at risk of arrest and detention and you don't cross borders, uh, statistically, it's much safer to write them down. Um, don't obviously stick them to your computer, but you can keep them like, somewhere safe in your home. Uh, much safer than having passwords that are very short or uh, reusing the same password on many accounts or on any other account. Um, that will prevent hacking, basically, which online abusers do like to do. Um, so that's kind of um, a little bit of a very quick walkthrough uh, on that. And we do have resources that uh, we can send out, which will guide you through that. So I would want to turn it over to, to the group. I'm sure you guys have questions, you're journalists. So um, if you could uh, raise your hands or put, uh, put it in the Q&A. Um, please, I'm sure you have many questions for our experts here. And while you're doing that, I'm just looking at the participant list. If not, I'm going to start calling on people, something I do all the time. It's the <laughs> professor side of me that does that. Um, well, while people decide what, what they're going to ask, um, Kat, so since Ella said that, the, that your newsroom is actually one that's been trained and that's actually quite good, how much support did they give you um, and in what sort of support? I mean, if something costs money, did they pay for it, for example? You know, have they, you know, have they given pay for password manager? Have they given you, you know, have, have, and what's the what's the what's the support they gave you and what do you wish they gave you? Right. That's that's a really good question. Well, I would say maybe the first thing that that they had like, um, you know, they sent over the different like resources um, and, you know, for like online harassment. And also they recommended that I take out my like email address from the the bio online since so many of my, um, so since so many of the messages were coming to, to my email. Um, but in terms of like money towards, uh, you know, getting like a password manager or, you know, um, or trying to delete some of these, um, you know, um, information about me from the internet. Um, I was not provided like support with with that. Um, and I think just like in the future, um, I, you know, at the time of these stories, I was very new to my position. And um, I think it's like, you know, it would be great if like news organizations like give like more trainings um, on online like uh, I think that would be very like helpful um, like alongside having a guy um, like a training as as well um, for like new like employees I think that would be very helpful so, so sort of basic onboarding I mean this is sort of should be should be required a required part of required part of it um and are, are L are there are there newsrooms that are doing that now? They've just sort of included this as part of the onboarding process. Um, well, ideally, it would be included in the onboarding process. A lot of 
new students we've worked with have included it within their onboarding manual. Um, but obviously, training is money. New Zooms are short on money these days, so it can be quite difficult. Um, and also, if there's a high staff turnover, one of the issues we've noticed is you can create the best practice. You can train journalists, but journalists leave, new journalists come. Who's, who's staying on top of that and managing that? Um, and that's why it's important to get HR involved from the beginning, um, because maybe that HR, so in some new Zooms, HR is the editor and also the IT person. So it really depends on the size of the newsroom and how much support they can offer in terms of financially as well, how much support they can offer. Um, Delete Me is expensive if you add it up for many journalists within your newsroom or other data broker removal services. One password actually does free accounts for journalists. So I would recommend that you have a look at that. Um, they have one password for journalism um, um, and you can, and you can um, sign up for that. Um, but obviously it costs, it costs money, um, you know, and, and there are bigger issues new Zooms need to think about as well. So one of the things we encourage them to think about is how much support can you offer and also to be honest about that support. So what you don't want is a journalist who's been doxxed, their home address is all over the internet, they've had to move out, but they find out their newsroom can't pay for that. So where do they go? Um, do they still have to work during that period, for example? So getting newsrooms to think through these issues in advance is, is really helpful for the newsroom because then they can say, look, if this happens, we are able to provide this for this amount of time. And after that, like, yeah, we can do this, this and this. Um, some newsrooms can't afford to pay for journalists to move out of their home because their budget is too small, but maybe they can offer time off, for example, paid time off or mental health support through insurance. Uh, maybe they can start to build community networks in the newsroom. Um, this is increasingly more important as newsrooms, we were speaking about this earlier, are more remote. So people aren't coming into the office so much. So you're not connected to people as much. There's no kind of chatting to people around the water cooler like they used to so you know this this kind of self almost kind of exchanging information between journalists around like how to protect against issues or which issues are causing more conflict or could be tricky it's it may not be being picked up on especially for younger journalists coming into the newsroom because you know they're just starting out on their journalism career they don't have years of experience behind them um and they can often be vulnerable to attacks and uh, you know, I not I on several occasions spoke to journal editors at newsrooms, small local newsrooms who had sent out, you know, their new like young reporter or just a you know, reporter, junior reporter to cover a protest, which was actually a far right or outright or um, march. Um, and then that journalist would be doxxed and the journalists were completely unprepared for that. The newsroom was completely unprepared for that because they hadn't assessed the risk they hadn't seen what the risk and they wouldn't have known that doxing was a very common tactic used by by these groups so um planning for that in advance is really important that's why risk assessment can be really great um a great tool getting newsrooms to think through risk assessment processes so so we have two questions one from someone named theo i'm not sure i don't have the list in front of me um do you recommend any apps for password managers? This person says, I went to a seminar that suggested LastPass and then LastPass had its data stolen a few months later. All right. This has always made me actually nervous about password managers. I sort of wondered how, how secure they are. It seems to me every time I get my snail mail, I'm getting another warning that like something else of mine has been hacked and we're going to give you a year of you know, <laughs> of protection. Are there any of these apps? Are they actually secure? So one of the things about digital security and safety that journalists really hate is that it's a changing environment. Uh, so something that was safe, you know, yesterday isn't safe today. Um, and the reason for this is, is that tech changes, um, vulnerabilities become open, um, hackers attack, governments and other groups are always looking for ways to attack and and find access and people in my industry are always looking for ways to protect so it's always in a kind of constant change um which is frustrating for journalists because they just want to say use this tool it'll work forever and it'll be fine and it, i'm afraid digital safety isn't like that um so nothing you use that is connected to the internet in any shape or form is 100 percent safe um or any device and the reason for that is is there was always a possibility that there is a vulnerability there in some area that could be um, um, leveraged. Um, so what you're looking for is really for journalists to stay up to date with the latest tech information and you're all journalists. So this, 
you know, it's just research, so it should be pretty okay for you to do. The best way to do it is just to sign up to the tech section of a big newspaper, national newspaper, and just get it coming into your inbox. And you'll just stay up on like, who's buying who, what data breaches have there been, who's been hacked, what hacking groups are out there. You don't have to investigate in depth. You just have to have a general read of what's happening in the global sphere around this issue. Um, I think Elon Musk buy out of Twitter, for example, is a very good example of you know, what happens when a tech tool that we all depend on changes hands, right? Um, I know journalists who built their entire career on Twitter and are now just really floundering because it's so difficult to access audiences and, and get the information. So um, in order to answer your question, no, nothing is 100% safe. But if you're looking to use something, there are certain things that you should look for, like who owns this tool? What are they doing with your data? And how are they storing that data? So in terms of password managers, for example, password managers are currently the industry best practice for passwords for the majority of people. There are certain groups within that who, who may be advised not to use them. They're more, most more high risk ones. Um, so date password managers are keeping your passwords in encrypted form on their servers. What does that mean? If someone hacks a password manager, they can't gain access to those passwords. Um, in the terms of LastPass, what we saw was security breaches, but no actual passwords being accessed. Um, but the fact that they'd had several security breaches made people very unsettled and, you know, people have been migrating off LastPass, basically. It means their general security ethos uh, may not be as, as secure as people want. So, you know, you have to move elsewhere. And that is for any tech tool that you use. So now maybe people aren't using Twitter, they're moving over to LinkedIn. Um, you may be using iMessage one day, but may have to migrate over to WhatsApp another. Um, so having many options in play is always, is always good as well. So don't just rely on one thing and expect it to work forever in the world of tech, it generally doesn't. So we have some questions. Theo, I'm just going to answer your question really quickly because that's one that I actually know something about. This is, Theo asked whether there's any suggestions. And Theo, I believe, is Theo Greenlee, Greenlee from uh, Senior Reporter at KUCB. Um, uh, suggestions when finding, choosing a fixer on a reporting trip, especially abroad, questions to ask or things to look for when initially assessing risk before a trip. I would just say for finding a fixer, find somebody who's worked in that country already and ask their advice. Um, that's the only way you can do it. It's just the same way if you're going down a road and whether or not there, you think there are mines on that road, ask people who know. Um, you're not, there's like no, it's, you just have to rely on the kindness of people who, who've who already worked in that environment. Um, and it's just, that's what I did for years and years and years working abroad is that I always relied on people who knew more. I can tell you the first trip I had was in Haiti, the overthrow of baby doc, yes, I'm that old. And I was flipping out and I called my husband, a very experienced foreign correspondent. And he said to me, find, find Alfonso Charty from the Miami Herald and do everything that he or, he's already doing. <laughs> he was completely right. And that's how I learned how to do it. So that's, you know, that's, there's no secret here. That's just find, find more experienced reporters. And they're usually really kind and they're really, really helpful. So there's a question from, is it Steve Doyle? S.T. Doyle. What suggestions do you have for journalists facing physical threats? How should journalists be prepared for that? I, um, Ella, Tat, I, I don't know. I do, this is focused on digital, but do you guys, have you heard of any training? I know that that you know, when our, my reporters at the journal went overseas, they had a lot of training on security, particularly the ones who went to Afghanistan and Iraq, but we had to pay for it. Um, you know, we had security companies that train, trained them as, have you heard anything about people being trained for, for physical protection um, in the United States? Yeah, the IWF is currently actually on their uh, US safety tour. So they're visiting states and training them in physical and digital safety. So you can go to the website and um, and, and check that out. Um, so they they do do the also the HEFAT training as well. Um, I'm not a physical security expert, um, so I can't really speak to that. But yes, there are organizations that offer this. Um, but uh, there's a lot more that are obviously paid for than are actually free. Um, um, but yes, there, there are organizations out there that do offer this type of training, um, press freedom organizations. Ted, have you done any training on physical security? for? Because you're out and about in the community all the time. Yeah, yeah. so I would also um, echo the um, IWMF's um, heat fat training. During the, the training, like we learned how to, like, you know, if we're in a protest and it gets extremely like hostile, we learned how to navigate ourselves like out of that situation. Uh, we we learned how to navigate if there's a mass shooting, like what what to do 
if, you know, um, you know, if we're, you know, getting kidnapped or so we learned how, how to navigate that situation. So I would definitely recommend um, um, IWMF's like he that training as something um, for folks to, to use to learn how to navigate these, these different uh, physical threats that can come up in, in the field. Great. Well, we will share a link to that as well when we send out our follow up our follow up emails. That's great to know that that's that that's available. Um, also, never go in the center of a crowd. Hug the buildings. You don't want to get trampled. It's one of the another thing my husband taught me in the early days. <laughs> These are all really useful things. Um, question for a reporter who covers a remote minority community in a news desert. She must be visible on social media for sources to reach her. At the same time, she's getting harassed, doxxed. We provided delete me, but she still needs to be findable. Best practices. That was the, I mean, it, it seems to be sort of, that's the great paradox here. You know, how can you be visible so people can find you, but at the same time, you don't want to get people, the wrong people finding you. How do we balance that? Yeah, and like I said, it's different for each journalist. Um, it depends on the degree of harassment and how comfortable and who's harassing you as well. So generally, if the people who live close to you are harassing you, the physical threat level is higher. Um, so that's something to, to be mindful of. Um, um, so, you know, if you're, some of the most challenging cases are journalists who report on the communities that they are living in and those communities are hostile to them in some form. Um, and it can be very, very difficult for them to, to stay safe because they also know where you live because, you know, they know your aunt or whoever, like they like live three doors down. Um, but I think really it's then about putting best practice in place. So having a plan for what if this happens, what will we do as a newsroom to support this journalist? Um, and maybe seeing, asking the journalist what they feel that they need. Um, so when it comes to harassment on social media, I'm afraid a lot of responsibility for managing that harassment should come from the platforms, but it doesn't. Um, and um there are very few practices now in place, especially, uh, you know, what we've seen with X or what was previously Twitter. Um, you know, the security there is is not as efficient as it once was. I think I could say that. Um, so, you know, you can be reporting things, uh, but nothing's happening. Or they say that it adheres to their community guidelines. Um, that Often we hear that from Facebook, for example, or Instagram. One thing you should know if you're reporting harassment is you should read the community guidelines and see how that harassment you need you need to parrot the same language back to them so you need to show them how the harassment is violating their community standards um and just use the same words in your in your report and document it so keep a spreadsheet of who what platform it happened on take a screenshot of the abuse uh don't just have the url because people because people delete it. So make sure you have the handle name, the date, the time, et cetera, um, and the harassment, the platform it happened on, whether you reported it, who you reported it to, have you heard back from them? Why would you document it? Well, it really depends. Maybe, you know, it's just personal so you can track it. Maybe it's for you to show editors, maybe it's to take to the authorities, but that's not always appropriate for everybody. Um, you may or may not want to document and you can't document everything. So you're just looking for threat to life there, I would say. Um, and and it can be helpful to get, I know Tat mentioned this, that have like a community of people who can help you with that. Um, so in the case of this journalist, like what's their uh, external support network like? Are there other journalists that that journalist can be in contact with? Um, what can you offer that journalist in terms of support? So does that journalist need time every week to kind of document this during work hours so she doesn't or he doesn't have to spend their time doing it on the weekend? Uh, do they need access to mental health provision? Do they um, need an IT team? So it sounds like it's a small outlet. You probably don't have maybe have an IT team or the, you know, the, the owner is probably the IT person. That's normally how that often works. Um, so um, what can you do there to make sure their accounts are secure? Um, and make sure they know that they don't always have to be online. So one of the most important things for journalists um, is for people to contact them. Um, but if you're on a device all the time and that device is just blowing up with hatred, it can be quite useful to have a different device, um, a different phone number that you use for personal use. Um, and that, you know, maybe you don't work on weekends, you switch your work phone off so you don't have to be reading all this abuse. I know switching a phone off for journalists is never going to happen um but in some cases um it could be useful if you're in the middle of a sustained like 
vicious attack. Um, you know, just having your phone explode with calls, messages, emails, um, all just coming at you 24 seven is really not, not great. And it really impedes your ability to do work as well. Um, so, you know, putting a bit of separation there and helping that journalist, letting that journalist know that you support that journalist doing that is really helpful. That's a really good, important step for newsroom to do, kind of giving them that support. So one of the things that Ella said in the chat, the chat I want to ask you about, um, it, Ella said something about knowing something about who your attacker is, because then you might know more about whether they just, they're just going to dox you. I'm not, don't mean just, but that they're, they're going to focus on doxing versus they maybe want to hack your personal accounts or they want to go after your aunt, or they may actually come to your newsroom and physically threaten you. The people have patterns of what their attacks. When you were getting attacked over the story you were doing about um, a drag laws, did you have a sense? Did you know who was attacking you? Did you research it? Um, yeah, I I did. Um, at first, it just seemed like it was just like random folks, you know, from, you know, the, the internet. But I started to see that it was definitely this, uh, like, conservative Facebook page. Um, like, everyone from that conservative Facebook page, they were all definitely emailing. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm definitely maybe not 100% sure about that. But it seemed like the Facebook page um, took the harassment to a whole different um, level, especially because they included like where I work. Um, they, you know, had spoke about like a tweet that I had wrote about like the journalism industry in general in terms of diversity. Um, so many of the attacks started to heighten from the Facebook page and then the article that was written um, about me. Um, and so for me, it's really important for me to, you know, check, um, you know, what is being, you know, written about me through either Google searches or I will search Facebook. And that's how I came uh, across this, um, you know, conservative Facebook page. I think they were called like the Whiskey Cowboys or something like that. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's how I look at, that's how I came across them. Um, it, it was after I had done like a like a search of my name in um, in Facebook. And if I had not done that search of my name, I would not have realized like why it was becoming so intense. Because um, before then I did, you know, def definitely I get some emails here and there, but never something as targeted as it was. I'm like, whoa, like these are getting like really, really personal. And then with the Facebook page, it was very, very personal attacks on, on me. Uh, so Ella, I, I think my final question to you is sometimes a Facebook page isn't necessarily who we think it is. I mean, it could be the Iranians. It could be somebody in New Jersey. Um, it's not, I mean, Donald Trump, it's some 300 pound guy in a basement in New Jersey. Okay, well, that's a story for another day. Um, do you guys or does someone else have you know, has done more forensic research so that if we're, get, we're getting attacked, we could say that looks like X group and we know that they tend to mainly focus on doxing or you probably should be more aware that they're going to go after your financial resources. Is there some sort of a guide for particular groups and the way they do their work? Um, not a guide as such, but yes, there are journalists who've researched uh, the people who harass them and it also makes very good stories after <laughs> journalists who've written yeah. stories about that um and um obviously there are tech professional it professionals who can also look into that they can study things like ip addresses and things um and it helps build up a picture of, of who who the attackers are and um but i think here the important thing is is if you are writing on a particular store on a particular topic or on a particular region of the world um knowing who's active online in the with regards to that topic and regards to that region of the world and what they can do in terms of their tech capacity is, 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 is important, ideally before anything happens so that you can put steps in place. But how, how would I, if I work at a medium size or small newspaper, you know, where would I turn for help for that sort of risk assessment as, as, as I'm launching into that, you know, how would I know that if I'm going to go down this road that I might draw the ire of X, Y, or Z that has this capacity? Where would I look for that? 
Yeah, speaking to other reporters who cover this the same beat is very helpful, whether in your in your state or just like if you have reporters in other areas of the country um, or in other countries. Um, you know, if you're covering like international news, like speaking to them and finding out if they ha what digital threats they faced is a really useful step. So connecting to that network, like you talked about, fixes um, in in different countries, like getting a feel for it. But ideally, this should come from the newsroom themselves. So you know, ideally, newsrooms should be proactive about doing risk assessments, um, and ideally, they should train managers. Um, they should train editors on this so a lot of responsibility does kind of fall to the editor but a lot of them haven't been trained in how to like roll out a risk assessment appropriately um and um so getting newsrooms to really be proactive about this training their editors um and being you know looking at the risk assessments putting them in front of people and and getting them to and asking them to fill them out um, because a risk assessment really is about mitigating risk it's getting you thinking what are the risks how can you reduce them in a way that makes it safer for you to to go about your daily life but also to continue reporting which at the end of the day is what all journalists want to do has anybody like pew or anybody else brought together sort of a con compendium of of uh, you know significant online attacks of the journalists have suffered on the sort of organized by topic or something that would be really useful yeah there's a number of organizations that have published um on this there's been a lot of academic research done um the icfj and uh unesco did one um the chilling it's called that was a global look um against women journalists and involved a lot of case studies we have um our online violence response hub which tat mentioned earlier which i'm very pleased to know that tat was using um which is a one-stop shop for all things uh, online harassment related. And there you will find the latest research. So um, you can, can go there and search for academic research, but it also has like digital safety guides, guidance for newsrooms, as well as for journalists and for those who want to support journalists uh, to better protect themselves. That's great. Ella, Tat, thank you both for, for this. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Irina. We're going to push out these resources. And this has just been, a, a, I'm fascinated. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you. Yes, and I, I echo that, Ella Steepley and Tat Bellamy Walker, and of course, Carla Ann Robbins. Thank you very much for this conversation. We will send out the resources uh, and the link to this webinar and transcript. Um, as always, we encourage you to visit CFR.org, foreignaffairs.com, and thinkglobalhealth.org for the latest developments and analysis on international trends and how they are affecting the United States. And of course, you can email us to share suggestions for future webinars by sending an email to localjournalists at CFR.org. So thank you for being with us today, and thanks to all of you for your time. We appreciate it.